Thanks for watching this message from Bold Conference, our youth and young adult conference at Radiant Church here in Kansas City. If you'd like more content, make sure and like and subscribe. Hey, Bold Conference, Bold 2020, good to be with you all. I have heard such great things about the Bold community, and I'm so honored to, to be a part of it. I really wish we could have uh, been together in person, but with everything that's happened, I so love what David and Renata have done to move this conference online so that we could still be together in this way and be encouraged and go after God together. Just want to quickly say thank you to David and Renata. They have been such a source of encouragement for me in the short time that I've been getting to know them, um, just such encouragers and a father and mother who really are just passionate about young people. And so they've impacted my life. Thank you so much, David and Renata. And I'm so excited to be with the Bold community. And hopefully I get to be with you guys in person someday. Um, I'm a youth pastor, uh, youth pastor at Jesus Culture Sacramento. I have been for the last five years. And I'll be honest with you guys, it was not my dream to be a youth pastor. I was not on the career path of being a youth pastor. I didn't grow up in church. And honestly, I didn't even know what a youth pastor did. So when I got thrown into this, you know, it was a whole different, a different ball game for me. And uh, I have come to absolutely fall in love with teenagers and I, and I love what I do now. But I will say, preaching to teenagers is it is not for the faint at heart. Like I can preach to adults and, and young adults and there's like a general kind of etiquette that they know to, to cheer a preacher on. You know, they're gonna pity laugh at my jokes. They're gonna clap every now and then. They know when to, when to cheer me on and when I need some encouragement. But teenagers, none of that exists. They are not easily impressed. They have no filter, no need to flatter me as a preacher. You know, so I'm with my youth group and I'm like, I'm going after it. I'm, I'm preaching messages that I feel like, you know, this is the moment that we're going to see revival at Rise Youth and, you know, Jesus Culture Youth are going to give their lives over in this moment and this is going to be the, the point that changes everything and preaching my heart out and I look out just to see my students bartering for Skittles, trading, you know, trolley gummy worms that I've set out for them, passing a phone down the aisle. And I realized, oh, the point was not what I thought it was. Teenagers, you could be a little bit brutal to preach to, but listen, this is just an encouragement for you and, and advice. Go, go home, go to your youth pastor and just thank them and say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna try better when you're preaching. We're gonna, we're gonna pity laugh at your jokes and we're gonna clap sometimes for you. That's what you guys could do for your youth pastors. But I'm excited. Let's get into the word. Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. We're gonna dive in and we're gonna talk about Joseph today. Let me give you some quick context of what we're about to read Israel in the Bible, formerly known as Jacob, was Abraham's grandson. And this man went on to have 12 children of his own, but there was one that kind of stood out from among the rest of his 12 sons. There was one that he had that was his favorite. Now, I know we're not supposed to say this, but you know, you know if you're your parents' favorite. I can say that because I know I was my parents' favorite. I mean, you just know. They, the parents will say, I love you all the same, but even, <laughs> even Israel here, he had a favorite son. So let's pick up on verse three, and we're gonna read this story. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock. And Israel said to Joseph, are, you, are, you, are not your brothers feeding the flock? Come, I will send you to them. So he said, here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So here, Israel is sending his favorite son, Joseph, out to go check on the brothers who are feeding the sheep. 
So go to verse 15. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him saying, what are you seeking? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Tell me where they are. And the man said, they've departed from here. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went and found his brothers. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near him, they conspired against him. And they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us kill him and cast him into some pit. So what happens here is Joseph's brothers take him and they, they see him coming. They say, there's that dreamer. We're going to kill him and throw him into the pit. And if you don't know what happens, Joseph gets thrown into his, the pit. His brothers leave him to die. But God intervenes in Joseph's life. He gets taken out of that pit. And through the whole, as the story of his life unfolds, he goes through all this stuff. But, but Joseph ends up in Pharaoh's house favored, promoted, and ends up actually a second in charge next to Pharaoh ruling over Egypt. So what happens in Joseph's life is actually the dreams that God gave him come to pass. And he actually ends up living that out. I want to talk to you tonight about what happens when young people become awakened to the dreams that God has for them, the dreams in their heart. I love working with teenagers because these really are the critical years of your life. Like these are important years where God is shaping you and molding you into who you're going to become in the world. It's just a, an absolute privilege to be a part of a young person's life. And what I have found is that there is something so beautiful that happens when a teenager becomes awakened to God. There is an audacity and a boldness that rises up in them that is unstoppable. There was a girl that was in my first youth group, the, the year that I took Jesus Culture Youth Group. Um, her name was Marin, and she came in as a junior and she was kind of, you know, half in, half out, raised in, raised in the church, but really struggling with her walk. Not sure if she wanted to fully go all in for God. And I began to meet with her and, and disciple her and, and we rallied around her as leaders and just really saw a call of God on her life and uh, began to speak into that. And so we walked with her for a couple years. And what happened is her senior year, she comes to a Jesus Culture Conference. And she was just at that critical moment where she had to choose, you know, who was she going to become? What was she going to do with the next year of her life? She had come with some friends to the conference. And what I had found out later was there was alcohol in their trunk. And they had planned to, after the conference, go and party and get drunk. That's, that's where she was at. She was coming, but she was just struggling with going all in. At the conference, she gets called out by the speaker, gets a prophetic word, and just encounters the power of God, the presence of God, has this beautiful moment in worship where God reveals to her what she is called for, the dreams that he has on her life. Marin goes out after the event, goes in the parking lot, smashes all the alcohol, fully surrenders herself over to God. I have never seen a young, people, a young person so determined. She raised something like $10,000 in the span of six months to go to YWAM, fully funded, goes to Hawaii, just goes on this crazy journey of giving her life over to God, does missions, and now has come back and is a, a leader in our youth group. And she is changing young girls' lives. She is one of our best youth leaders. She's discipling young people, telling her story. And this is what happens when a young person gets a hold of the God dream for their life. They just become unstoppable. They become immovable. And it is such a beautiful thing that happens when a young person becomes awakened. God wants to awaken the dreams in your heart. And I specifically feel that he is doing something in the, in the generation of teenagers today. He's releasing a generation of dreamers. And that's what he wants to do. But what happens is you get told, you know, as a young person, don't get your hopes up. That's a phrase we've all heard. That's a phrase we, we've probably said to other people. Don't get your hopes up. We say it to ourselves. You know, we kind of live in this pessimistic society that really wants us to be practical. Be practical with your, with your future, make good plans, go to a, a, a good school, you know, look at the odds and statistics and, and make sure you're not setting your sights too high on something too crazy. And so we don't, we don't wanna get our hopes up or we feel disqualified from greatness because of where we've come from. We discount ourselves because of our family situation, because of where we've grown up, because of our past, for whatever reason, we kind of fall into this, you know, I'm either gonna not get my hopes up because I don't wanna be too, I don't wanna be disappointed, or I'm not even qualified for greatness. Have you seen where I come from? We believe the lie that we're disqualified because of where we've come from, because our families, you know, our family's too dysfunctional. Look at Joseph's family. We're talking about dysfunctional, 
You know your family's messed up when your 11 brothers want to kill you or sell you into slavery. I mean, these guys were messed up. This story here, in verse 18, they see him coming and they say, here comes the dreamer. They're not complimenting Joseph. They revile him. There is something inside of these brothers that is so envious and jealous of the favor and the audacity on Joseph's life to dream with God, to dream of doing something great. Like they're, they're mocking him in this moment. They're, you know, it's not like, oh, here comes our little brother. He's such a dream. Let's, here comes old champ. There he is. There's tiger. No, they're like, here comes the dreamer. Here comes, here comes our little brother who thinks he's going to do something with his life. Here comes, that, here comes that kid with his head in the clouds. Oh, here comes the dreamer. They're mocking him in that moment. So Joseph's family, you know, he didn't come from a perfect family. This is a dysfunctional, messed up situation here. So much so that they want to kill him. And they're going to lie to their dad and say, you know, a beast took him. I came from a dysfunctional family. I, my dad left when I was young. I was raised by a single mom. There was all kinds of drug addiction and mental health issues in my family. And what happened as a teenager, God put a dream in my heart and something began to stir in me that I was created for more than my current situation. I, I would daydream about leaving this. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest middle of you know nowhere, rural town in Indiana. And I would dream, I would actually dream of going to California, which is where I live now. I would dream 14 and 15 years old of getting in a car and driving away or, or getting in a plane or, or doing something that nobody in my family had ever done. What if, I, what if I went to college? What if I left this town? What if I became, you know, what if I became something great and did something with my life? And that voice would, would, roll around in the back of my mind, you know, oh, be practical, Becky, don't get too crazy with your dream or you think you could ever break out of this family cycle? Look at, look at where you come from. But that's a lie that the enemy tells young people, tells people all the time, you're disqualified, look where you came from. You gotta look past that and begin to get with God and ask him, what do you have for my life? What, what's stirring on the inside of you and allow him to breathe on your dreams and, and, and move in your life and open your eyes to the greatness that he has prepared for you. Another thing that happens is we don't, we don't dream at all or we don't dream big enough. We keep our minds focused on, you know, I'm gonna set a plan for my life and I'm gonna make sure that it's something I can do myself. And we, we create a, a life of plans that don't require God. They don't require God to move. They don't require the impossible bowing to the name of Jesus. Listen, that, those aren't dreams, those are plans. That's not dreaming with God, that is planning your life in your own means, but that is not the life that you are called to live. You are called to live a life that requires impossibilities to bow to the name of Jesus, that requires God's hand and favor on your life. But it's scary to do that. It's scary to be a dreamer. Dreaming with God requires us to not care about what our brothers may think or what they may do to us. So again, Joseph has these dreams. He, God is revealing to him the greatness that he has laid out for him, that Joseph is going to do something incredible. God's going to use Joseph for his plans and purposes. And he comes to his brothers and immediately they mock him, they hate him, they envy him, they're jealous of him. And, and now they're planning to tear him down. But we have to be okay with what our brothers may think of us once we start to talk about what we wanna do with our life. Once we start to believe that God has something laid out for us, once we begin to, to partner with God and, and dream for ourselves, we have to be willing to say, you know what, brothers, you might be jealous of this. You might, you might laugh at this. You might make fun of this. You might even try to take me out, but I am more convinced. I'm more confident in what God has for me than I am in your opinion of me. And to separate from that, just the way Joseph did, despite what his brothers were doing, despite what they, what they thought about him or made fun of him, he stood fast to his dream. And it worked out for him, because the story is amazing. It reminds me of Derek, my husband, and I, we, we were high school sweethearts. I met him when I was 15, we started dating right away. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a more nervous type, I'm a bit of a worry war, I, you know, I, it really takes me partnering with God to, to be a crazy dreamer. So, you know, on the, the normal day-to-day, -day, I'm, I'm just a, a more reserved kind of person. I'm not a 
thrill seeker. I don't like taking risks. And uh, early on in our dating relationship, Derek, you know, one day he looks at me, he goes, you're so cute, you're, you're like Filbert. And I'm like, aw, thank you, that is so sweet. Who is Filbert? And I'm thinking he's complimenting me and, you know, falling more in love with how cool I am. And I come to find out that Filbert is a character from a cartoon called Rocco's Modern Life. And he is essentially a nervous turtle. He is a turtle that wears thick glasses and he is animated. He is like, he has like ulcers and he's just like, you have to, Filbert is not cute. This was not a compliment. Filbert is like always rocking on his shell and he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know, Rocco. I'm nervous. Oy, it's giving me an ulcer. I'm nervous. I'm scared. And they have like sweat animated, always dripping from his brow and his eyebrows are always furrowed. And he's just walking around talking about, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, that's what I am? I'm Filbert? That is not cute. And Derek's, you know, cracking up. And I'm like, I refuse to be Filbert in my Christianity. Listen, we do not need a bunch of nervous turtle Christians running around being scared to dream big and scared to have vision and wondering what people think and afraid of failure and afraid of disappointments. That is just not the life that we're called to. God doesn't want us hiding in some corner in our churches and in our youth group just waiting for the world to pass us by. He wants us to get out there and be a part of making history and changing the world and tearing down the plans of the enemy. And you can't be Filbert if that's what you're gonna do. You can't be a nervous turtle that's sweating all the time. Although sometimes I do still have my, my Filbert moments. Another thing that happens is we're just okay with, with dreaming someone else's dream. This is the, okay, if I could just be real with, with, my, with my guys for a second, girls too, but it's mainly guys who play video games. There is, this was not a thing when I was a teenager. There is a whole YouTube culture where young people watch other people play video games. It is the, I still, this many years in, cannot wrap my head around the idea of watching a video of someone else play a video game. It's the craziest thing. And my daughter, my daughter does a form of this. My six-year-old loves YouTube kids. The videos she watches are of other people playing with the toys that she has. It is, it is mind boggling to me. She, I'll be sitting next to her and it's the dolls that she has. The, like the dolls that I actually, she has the actual dolls next to her. She's not watching people play with toys she doesn't have. I've bought her the toys and she'll pull up a video and it's hands playing with dolls or people playing with Play-Doh. And I'm like, honey, do you, would you like to play with some Play-Doh? Or you know, you have that toy. She's like, yeah, I know. I just like watching someone else play with it. It's, it's exactly like we're watching someone else beat the level in Call of Duty and we're like excited and we're like, oh, that's awesome. Like you were, we are, li we are live, we're watching someone else's success, watching someone else's victory. And this is what we're doing in our lives with social media. All of a sudden, I'm okay to just watch your vacation. I'm okay to, to watch your success. I'm okay to, to watch your life unfold as I sit eating flaming hot Cheetos in my room and I'm completely disengaged from actually living my own life. I didn't play Call of Duty growing up, but I did play some Super Nintendo. If anybody knows or remembers what Super Nintendo is, Super Nintendo, and I was good too. The main game that we played in Super Nintendo was Mario. So Mario, Super Mario World, Mario Brothers, all different kinds. The bad guy in Mario is Bowser. So all the people who know who Bowser is and you have to save Princess Peach. My friends and I, or my siblings and I would stay up till you know, who knows when, trying to beat the final level of Mario to beat Bowser. And this is what would happen. We would begin to like fight over whose turn it was. You'd beat the level, you'd get to Bowser and you're like, all right, who's gonna beat him? And now you're fighting over the controller and you're, you're pulling, you know, and you're pressing A, 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 B, B, B. And you're like, you're messing up the game, Bowser's mine. 
I would never, it did not satisfy me to sit next to my brother, Steve, and watch him beat Bowser. I was not satisfied by that. I was not amused by that. I was sitting there judging his every move, you know, very angry that he's throwing the fireballs at Bowser and I want to beat Bowser. Like, I want to beat the bad guy. This is my job. Listen, there, there is an enemy out there and we are not okay to just watch other people have success, to watch other people do the things that we're created to do. It's your job to beat Bowser and rescue Princess Peach. We are not okay to be in, so enamored with other people's lives that we have been disengaged and we stop living our own life. And I think what the enemy is trying to do is disarm a threat because dreamers are a threat to his plans. Dreamers are a threat to hell. So if he can disengage a generation and pacify us to live behind a screen and just be okay with everybody else out there making history, doing the big thing, and we're just sitting in our comfortable little hole, you know, being Filbert, all of a sudden he's disarmed a generation who's gonna tear down his plans and purposes and advance the kingdom of God. You're not called to live someone else's life or dream someone else's dream. Joseph wasn't consulting his brothers. Well, what do you think about that? Well, what are you gonna do? I'll just follow in, you know, I'm gonna follow in the family's footsteps or I'm gonna make sure that my dream is acceptable to all of you guys and, and your expectations. God gave him a dream. God has a dream for you, specific for you. You were created for a purpose that no one else can fulfill. And you've got to become awakened to that and walk in that and take a hold of that because those who change the world are anchored to their dream. They're anchored to it. Joseph didn't have this dream, right? This dream had him. It anchored him through all the crazy seasons that he would go through in life from being betrayed by his family, thrown into a pit. Then he gets falsely thrown into prison. He gets accused again. And through all the ups and downs of Joseph's life, what didn't move from him was the dream that God had given him. And he kept holding on to that until he saw it completed and it, it came to fruition and it happened in his life. If you've ever been really into something, you'll understand this again calling back to my, my junior high years, it was boy bands. Boy bands were the thing. I don't even know if you would know what a boy band is. There was Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. There were other boy bands, but these were the only two that matters, okay? So Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, and you were one or the other, you could not be a fan of both. I was a fan of the Backstreet Boys, obviously, because they're the best ones. And I was, guys, I was, it was, it was borderline unhealthy. I was pretty obsessed with Backstreet Boys, AJ specifically. I could tell you facts about AJ to this day. I won't, but I could. And so I would get every, you know, all the magazines. It was Tiger Beat, 17, Teen Bop, and they had these fold-out posters of your, your favorite boy band. And so I would get every magazine I could, and I'd unfold the picture, and it's, you know, the Backstreet Boys, and it's AJ, and I had them all on my wall. Saying the story out loud makes me sound like a creeper, but I promise you it was normal. I promise you. All of, the, all of the girls had it. And so I had pictures on my wall of the Backstreet Boys and AJ. I was so into them. And listen, then in, in Sync came along with Justin Timberlake. And all of a sudden, everybody was like, you know, they were topping the charts and Backstreet Boys were old news. And it was in Sync that was the new thing. And they were better. But I was convinced that that was not true. Backstreet Boys, it was immovable. The opinion in my heart, the dream in my heart was that the Backstreet Boys were the number one boy band. They were better. And to this day, I will meet women my age. I'm like, Backstreet Boys are in sync. And the BSB fans, we rally together. I was immovable in this. You could not convince me otherwise, no matter what. And this is what happens when you get a God dream in your heart. You become immovable. You become convinced that you were created for greatness. You become convinced that God has a plan for you. You become convinced that you could overcome any obstacle, that nothing could stand in the way. It's what anchors you. Your dream will fortify you. It will sustain you. It will encourage you. It will help you overcome temptation. When you become anchored to the dream, you absolutely will live a life that changes the world. And let me just speak to anyone watching who has discounted themselves up into this point thinking, maybe for my friend, maybe my cousin, maybe for the people next to me or those other kids at my youth group, but not for me. 
You were created to change the world. This is who you, this is, this is why you were created. You weren't actually your parents' idea. You were created by the father of the universe, the creator of the world, in the heavenlies. God made you and he thought of a plan and purpose when he made you. He's not wondering where to stick you. He's not confused about why you're on this earth. He used your parents as the vessel to bring you here because he has plans for your life that nobody else can fulfill. And that's why you're here. That's why you're alive. That's why you're watching this conference right now because there's something that he wants to stir in your heart. He wants to wake something up within you. He wants you to become convinced that he's in love with you and he wants to partner with you and he wants to see you live a life that fulfills his call. Listen, I want to take a minute. I'm going to invite my husband up who still to this day calls me Filbert. And I want to pray over you. I want to pray into this message. I want to pray over the dreamer inside of you and go after a couple things as he comes up. We're going to worship and pray together for just a minute. But listen, if it is the dreamers who change the world, but you will not be a dreamer if you are too insecure if you don't realize that you need to be one, if you don't believe that God has a call on your life or if you are stuck living someone else's version of your life or or someone else's expectation or someone else's dream. So I wanna pray over that as as we're doing this, as we're watching and having bold online 2020. I even feel like there's some that are watching who feel, who feel like Joseph in the prison. You feel stuck. You feel stuck in a moment to a, to a past choice you've made, to a habit that you can't break. You feel stuck to even a, a, a family expectation. I lived in that space for a lot of years thinking, I, I can't break out of this generational thing. Like how, how am I gonna set a different standard? How am I gonna break out of this pattern? How am I gonna be something different or do something different? But I want to encourage you, you can't do it, but God can. He wants to, and he will. A surrendered heart is all that God needs. And there's nothing, there's no plan of man, no circumstance, no small town, no no past decision. There is nothing that can halt God's plan for your life once you fully say yes and you give him your life and you surrender to him and say, "This this is what you can have, God. You can have my life. You can have my dreams, you can take them and I'll partner with you and I'll say yes and I'll, and I'll stay anchored. That's how you get the dream. If you're wondering, well, where do I start? What does that look like? You get with God, you get in the word. You begin to pay attention to what, what gets you excited, what gets you angry, what makes you emotional, what, what, can you, what keeps you up at night. When you're, when you're reading the word, Where do you get stuck? What do you, what do you keep coming back to? What just keeps rolling around in your mind? These are all clues that God gives us, pointing us to to what's inside of us, what he's created us for. I just wanna pray over you right now. God, I pray that you would awaken the dreamers in this generation. God, that you would unleash a freedom, you would unlock the hearts of young people to dream with you, to be bold for you, to pull in close to you, to lay aside the opinions of others, the expectations of others, past hurts, whatever goes on in in our family, whatever whatever we've seen on social media, all the the preconceived notions of what our lives should look like would fall to the wayside. And God, I pray right now, you would begin to give the young people watching a laser-like vision and focus for what you have laid out for them. There is even some of you who have known from an early age what you were created to do, but it has been been overshadowed by by hurt. It has been overshadowed by whatever, you know, disappointment and pain, or you thought, you, you somehow thought you must be wrong. I speak to that person, listen, the thing that used to stir you, even when you were, you're still young, but even when you were younger, that God would breathe on that again, that you would be reminded that that, that dream that has felt too crazy and out of reach would become awakened again, would become alive again. 
that boldness would rise up in you, that you would not be discouraged or disappointed over what's already happened, but you would be filled with a hope that God is going to use your life. And listen, where you've come from does not dictate where you are going. Your small town doesn't matter. Your high school doesn't matter. Whatever's, whatever's going on in your family, it doesn't matter. God, When God gets a hold of you, he'll take you where he wants to take you. God, I pray that you would give us hearts to stay surrendered. It takes such courage and boldness to follow you in today's world. God, I pray that you would embolden the bold young people right now. You would speak to their hearts. You would set them ablaze, that you would give them the audacity that they need to live out loud for you. God, would you come, just begin to speak to young people right now about what you have for them. Begin to light a fire inside of them, a hunger and thirst for your word, that those who feel without a dream would become so hungry and desperate for one that they would pull close to your word, they would devour it until they, until they find you, until they find their purpose, until they find their, their dream, God. Now we just give this to you, Jesus. Do you join me in just singing this song and sing this over your life, declare this over your own life? now that you are giving God everything and nothing less. Don't hold anything back. The things that you have been so, that you've been holding on to, that you've been reluctant to give up, just confess to God right now. You could have that part of me. You could have this part of me. You could have that way of thinking. You could have this habit. You could have this group of friends, whatever it is. And you know what it is right now in this moment. You know what it is that God's calling you to lay at his feet and lay at the altar. So would you come wherever you are, in your kitchen, in your bathroom, wherever you're watching from, with your youth group, whoever it is, just lay it at his feet right now. If you have to get on your knees, whatever it is, just, just confess to God, you can have my whole life and be filled with hope and courage. Listen, if you give God everything, he will give you more than you could ever have imagined. Your life will take off in ways that you can't even fathom right now. I never thought in a million years I would be where I am, married with two children in a marriage that's not falling apart. This is not the normal for my family. So listen, just give God everything that you are, everything that you have. He'll take you places that you just, you can't even understand right now. It just requires you saying yes. It just requires you saying you could have it all. Let that be your heart's cry right now. God, you could have it all. You're worth everything. You're worth everything. Search my heart. What have I not surrendered? What have I not let go? What am I afraid of? What am I afraid of, of, of releasing over to you? 
and let him speak. There's a moment right now. There's a moment right now. You can have our lives, God. Just tell him, you can have my life, God. You can have my life. Every aspect. Thank you, Lord, for this generation. Thank you for, for the bold family. Thank you for what you're doing. This group of young people, God, I pray that they would not be the same after this, these few days of, of watching online, of listening to messages, of worshiping together. She would move in their lives. And when they get back together, when the bold family is able to gather again, God, I pray that they would, they would be transformed and different. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bless you guys. Again, David and Renata, so thankful for you. Honored to be a part. Can't wait to be with you guys in person one day. We'll see you guys later.